Okay, so thank you everybody for coming out on a dark and cold night <laughs> to see some hot paintings <laughs> and uh, to come celebrate John's opening. And thank you to the gallery for uh, making this possible and for including me in this. Um, one of my my favorite people are, are John and Ina and to get to see them here. And Berlin is one of my favorite places and to have it all come together is really kind of a dream today. So. Um, Thank you, and thank you for these beautiful paintings and for inviting me to do a little conversation here with you. So, uh, I won't rehearse John's CV because you're here. I'm sure you all know who he is and what he does. But briefly, um, he's shown paintings like this and been working in this mode for uh, decades now. And these paintings have been celebrated all over the world and seen in many biennials on many different continents, from Sao Paulo to Guangzhou to the Whitney Biennial to solo shows in California and in New York and obviously uh, all over Europe as well. And uh, he's been working within a kind of uh, very narrow vernacular for a long time and plumbing it for all these amazing depths that he's finding. And uh, I have seen a lot of his shows and we have kind of an ongoing dialogue for the 15 years that we've known each other, and I've been lucky enough to have been invited into his studio over that time, and we kind of have an ongoing conversation, and I was extremely glad to see this painting here, which last time we saw each other looked different, but mm -hmm. we were sitting right about here with it too, uh, to see it again, and to see how his work has developed over this time, and it's been a real privilege to be close to it, because uh, he's really zeroing in on something that is very particular and very personal, uh, but yet also seems to speak to so many different people and more and more every day. Um, we got a coffee beforehand and we're kind of talking about how, how this conversation might go and I think we're going to just have a little back and forth and then maybe leave some room for some questions to include you guys and also try to keep it within the standing time limit before all your legs give out. If you want to come in and sit down, there's more <laughs> stools and more benches, too. Um, but one of the things that I sort of uh, asked John about was uh, positioning his work um, historically. And kind of, I was just saying what it was about his work that I enjoyed so much was that it kind of participates in two histories of painting and two histories of abstract painting that we normally think of as being um, sort of opposed. And his work finds a kind of dialectical marriage of these two main tendencies uh, in post-war painting. One is a kind of romantic, expressive history of abstraction, which we can kind of associate maybe with uh, American abstract expressionism and also in some of the abstract tendencies of California art in the 70s and 80s. And on the other hand, there's, there's, a, there's a position of a very materially oriented practice that is much closer to um, figures like uh, Robert Ryman and maybe Ad Reinhardt, um, people who are really focused on uh, pursuing the material, what, what makes a painting in a very kind of analytical way. And I think that his work is, is a really neat marriage of a kind of uh, a knowing analytical material exploration, mm -hmm. but at the same time having glimpses of a kind of romantic and expressive uh, possibility as well, and I think that's what makes it appealing to so many different people, and um, we just were talking today about what you were up to, and you had mentioned that you went to go see some paintings today, and I thought maybe we could talk about some of the paintings that you saw oh. as a way of... Just a way to start. As a way to yeah. start, yeah. Well, because romanticism comes in, because I went to the Alta Museum to see Caspar uh, W. Friedrich's paintings, which I just felt right at home with, you know, and uh, and even though I, this often happens when you go to a museum, so I, I had this, you know, quest to go see these paintings, uh, especially the newly restored uh, large painting, Monk, Monk of the Sea, um, which I kept thinking about. So my, what I loved about those paintings is the, uh, the kind of transitional light that he's using in these paintings, and um, especially that everything is either twilight, dusk, dawn, there's nothing, there's no bright light, and in a lot of ways that's what this work uh, felt like it was, I was involved in, in this work. But what surprised me is um, I saw this Christian Rolfs painting from 1900, 
this landscape with uh, this incredible chunky sky and sky. It reminded me of a Carl Friedrich Hill painting. It had this like, as if it was made with grit and sand and very different than his later work. And it just stopped me in my tracks. It just knocked me out. And mostly, it's the opposite of Kaspar David Friedrich in that Friedrich's surfaces are almost like they're painted on the last. They're just like, like almost in porcelain. They're so perfect and flawless. And this Rolf's painting is the opposite of that. It's just crunchy and crusty, and, and I just loved it. So I like have both these dichotomies and something where you have something very fine and refined and uh, a, a kind of ethereal light and then something that's really super chunky. It's almost like the opposite for me, it's like it's the opposite of this painting and that painting. Yeah, maybe that's a way to kind of anchor the discussion here a little bit. Um, we also were talking about these two paintings. This one, which uh, as I referred to before, you know, I'd seen in a previous state, and I know that it was a painting that um, came over a long period of time with many different campaigns of mm -hmm. paint and scrape and paint and scrape mm -hmm. um, against this painting here, which is in its identical format. And uh, I, my guess is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you get two paintings Two stretch. If you order two stretcher bars exactly the same size and they're that big, you're kind of thinking of these things together in in some sense before you even start. Yeah, and, and it, it's true because I, I like working on pairs of paintings. Yeah. I like the idea of two two paintings, not necessarily to show them together, but to have two being worked on at the same time. So it's something. Yeah. Also, when I start, it's uh, I've often said you know I don't have a preconceived plan and. But you know that's only half true because I have these ideas that are they're just not formed completely, and a lot of it is kind of hiding from myself what it is I want to do in order to be able to discover it in the process of making it. And um, but the de the decision for the format, the decision for the what cotton or linen I'll use. These are all aesthetic decisions that get, that get made. So I don't know if that answered your question. Well, I didn't even but get to my question because I, I, <laughs> I, I, was, I was just wanted to, first of all, remark on them as a, as a pair of objects that sort of, uh, in, that you encounter with your body at a mm -hmm. certain scale with a certain kind of um, brushwork and a certain mm -hmm. color family, but also just kind of talk about how different they they, they actually are, and that one painting is something that, as you told us, as you told me earlier and you shared, you know, sort of came quite quickly mm -hmm. relative to this, and is not, in some ways, not as labored, but has a very different kind of intensity, even though it's in the same general pictorial vernacular. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you would say these are like paintings that are a certain height and a certain width and have a certain amount of blue paint on them and they've got brushwork and then they've got a couple of lines that kind of tighten the edges. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're very, they're very similar in some ways, mm -hmm. but then in, another, in other ways they're extremely different. And I wonder if maybe, can you just talk a little bit about the difference of making these two paintings? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, it's, uh, in all of the paintings that are in this room, they're all made on a different surface. So usually um, the, way it, the way I think of it is uh, I have an idea for a format, whether that's a landscape format or a portrait format. I'm really partial to an 18th century, you know, full figure portrait. I just like that. I like that tall real vertical. But in this case, the horizontal format was chosen. And then um, I have different linens in the studio, and I then put them out. So this is a prime linen. This is also a prime linen, but it's been reversed, and I made a gessoed ground for this. So it has a completely different surface. And so what that means is, when I paint on them, this will accept paint in a very different, they're not gonna go down the same way. And the thing is, is that even if I had exactly identical surfaces on the paintings, paint still doesn't go down the same way. It's just one of those things that's kind of, you know, I, you know, it just doesn't do that. But um, so, like you said, this painting happened very quickly, and what quickly means is that it was painted all in one long session. So with a painting like this, this side, all the paintings, what I'm painting, I have to cover the whole surface at once. So I can't work from part to part to part. It all has to happen immediately. And part of it is that I'm, what I'm really looking for is always is a sense of immediacy, as if something just happened, mm. even if it took a many sessions and long going. A long time to paint. Also, I feel like 
if I could make paintings like this all the time, I would just be so happy because this was just magic. It's like the color was right, the brush was right, the surface was right, and it was just floating on this thing. And just, I was just out in this. It's, it's just the most wonderful feeling in the world. And then when I finished it, I wasn't sure. You know, then there's the doubt that creeps in. So I had to put it away for a while and get some opinions on whether or not I should touch it, seriously. And uh, even though I knew something was there, this painting went through a long period of many thin, transparent layers, scraped back, and then added, and then um, of the final, very thick layer, which I wanted to respond to the, uh, the darker layer underneath. And with, this, with the oil, these are oil paintings. And um, with the oil, I, all of the colors are a mixed color. There's not a pure tone in here. There's usually many mixed colors. But I think all the work on this painting, the physical labor on this painting, allowed something to happen really quickly on that painting. It's just the release of it. Okay. So I think that's nice when yeah. you're working with a pair. That reminds me of the famous, there was some famous line where somebody asked Matisse, who sort of had, you know, a kind of famously facile hand mm -hmm. and could, you know, draw a model and create an amazing drawing in seven seconds. So you say, how long did that drawing take? He always said, 30 years. Yeah, my whole life. He said, how long did that take? <laughs> my whole life. Yeah, yeah. Too, too. But, you know, I, I mentioned the too, because you also mentioned Ryman, which maybe we talk about. But um, I look at Matisse a lot in terms of his brushwork, because, the, and, and it's very different when you think of, like, the like sort of the myth of New York school painting, abstract expressionism, which is this paint from your gut. These are... Is the th it's what Rauschenberg sort of dispelled when uh -huh. he did Factum 1 and 2. Right. This gesture is not necessarily an emotional gesture that can only happen once. Matisse's brushwork is completely uh, working-like. It's like he's just putting it down and getting it done. And I like that a lot. And I like that Ryman had this investigative way of painting, just very factual. It's like dragnet, just the yeah. facts, you know, put it down. And what was interesting when you mentioned about the two, let's say this uh, factual kind of formalist material-based painting like Ryman, right. and then a more romantic, is when I was, I studied at Berkeley at the University of California, and my teacher was Elmer Bischoff, and we were, it was an improvisational type of painting, and it was, uh, we were looking at people like de Kooning, who I was more interested in Franz Klein than de Kooning, right. but that's not. And uh, the apps and uh, Gustin and all of this painterly improvisational painting, and I was in love with Ryman. And I would talk to Ryman, and they would go, mm. you know, they always didn't understand what I liked about Ryman. And I saw a show in 1990. I don't remember what it was. It was at Pace, and it was a two-part show. It was a beautiful, almost typical Ryman investigation of how to put paint on a wood surface. Turns the corner. It was everything you need in a Robert Ryman, and then there was a small room with three paintings that were just this huge, just these touches of white. And it was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. I felt like I was looking at late Titian. Oh, amazing. You know, so here, in one room, there was Ryman to sort of put on a work suit and just do the factual painting, and the next room was like the most romantic painting I've ever seen. And we don't see Ryman in terms of romance, but for me, it's a completely romantic. Painter. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, he's in 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 discourse. You know, he's kind of located in one position as mm -hmm. like the dragnet, just the facts. But then you can see a show like that, or you see moments like that where there's kind of an eruption of gesture mm -hmm. or of a different kind of position that shows mm -hmm. you that maybe art historians don't have it all right about painting all yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, one thing I would just say, though, you know, we could geek out on technical yeah. stuff like all night and, and that's the one thing that I really love about coming to your studio but I just want to make sure that everybody understands what he was talking about when he said that this is a pre-primed canvas that was reversed and then scraped down because this is not entirely obvious and it's not something that you would necessarily see and it's also right. not something that I would like think that many other painters do just to recap briefly so like that paint that painting there and correct me where I'm wrong is on um a piece of linen that has been pre-prepared with an oil-based primer, right? And so the idea is you can order that, you can stretch it, and you can begin to paint immediately on top of it. You don't have to prepare the canvas to accept the paint because the barrier has already been established 
between the uh, linen and the primer that's on top of it so that oil paint can be received by that. Mm -hmm. And it comes in that kind of white color that has a little bit of a yellow hue towards right. green. But what he did in this painting is he takes that same material, which is brown on the backside because it doesn't have um, oil primer on it, and stretched it backwards to begin this painting. So the, the, the surface is impermeable because it's been sealed from behind, but he's painting it the quote unquote wrong way from the back. And so there's also, uh, I think just even in that fact, and even as an artist who um, uses so many different materials, and I think you said to me when we were getting coffee that there are no two paintings in this show that have the same um, uh, support and medium pairing. There's, there, there's not a show of all oil on canvas. There's oil on linen. There's this temper on linen. There's this temper on canvas. That, that, that is also the kind of where we see the material concerns and your material interests and your material work and your material interventions um, in a very appealing way. And this is one of the things that you really can only see when you're looking at the paintings up close. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at the paintings in person, it's one of the great um, pleasures mm -hmm. of, I think, uh, viewing your work. Can you talk about some of those material experiments? I know we're, people's legs are probably already yeah, yeah. We're well, going to open um, it up to questions. In a well, second. what's interesting yeah. is like this says you have a, a darker color over a lighter ground. In this case, you have a lighter color over a darker ground. And I really, I really enjoyed that relationship, but I hadn't set out to plan, well, now I've got a light one, now I've got a dark one. Right. But, um, you know, uh, with the material, it basically starts like this. It's like there's a color that's in the back of my head that I know that I want, and I can't, it's, it's, not, it's not in language, it's just a sensation. And then the canvas itself is the first color of the paint. So when Jordan's talking about in terms of using all these, like this canvas comes from Belgium, you know, and the priming, what he's really, doing, what, he, what I'm thinking about is that that canvas becomes the first color, and then the primer is the second color. And Jordan's right that this comes straight from the factory and you can start painting on it immediately, but I actually do some things to, before that, but I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I'll just do something. And, um, but... Uh, so then this, the color that I paint on is actually already now the third color. So that when I prepare a ground, I'm mixing it from different pigments, which gives a different color when it interacts with the surface of the linen or the texture of the linen. So I'm constantly thinking about the painting appearing. Is that really, they, they come from the ground up. I mean, yeah, right. They really do. And I'm thinking about it as adding the color as successive layers and in some ways to get back to what was all, what I saw there in the very beginning, which has to do with the way the light hits that canvas of the first time, you know, when yeah. I first see it. Um, I don't know if that explains it, but... That's beautiful. Um, are there questions from the group that we want to entertain? I mean, I can sit here and we can talk like this for hours and hours, but I'm told that I'm not allowed to do that here, so... <laughs> um, John, your way of working uh, that each painting in a show like this has a different um, recipe, if you like. Yes. Yeah. So is, that, is that a conscious method to try and stay away from like, working in series? So, and the fact that each, like you were saying, that every painting is a different size, a different mix of media or technique, is that a, like, a conscious thing you do to stop you working too much in a particular way? Um, I, I would think it is in a way, but I also think it's just my my interest of how I like to do something new each time. So it's uh, so it does it, it like I said, it does keep me from knowing exactly what it's going to be like. And uh, even in the next in the room behind me, there are four paintings. I didn't set out to make a series of four paintings. I made one painting in Berkeley. I made another one in Iceland. I didn't think it was quite finished. I brought it back to Berkeley. I started two more in Iceland, brought them back to Berkeley. When I put them up, I realized when they were all together, they created a four, they created one work. And so it wasn't like I set out to make that series. So a lot of it is serendipity. And so it's also trying to keep things moving and alive.
Well, I'm going to fill ask. the time then if we're allowed to keep talking just for a second. Can I just ask yes. one one last question then maybe? Or yeah, are we good? No, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this question. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody get yes. lines actually mirror the edge of the canvas so you know exactly where things are and um, it, it's a way also of bringing in an extra color sometimes because a lot of times like in some of these the that line the line becomes a, a, different, a different color um, but it's um, just a sense of creating a, what, I wouldn't call it so much geometry as well as a kind of structure Okay. So, so like the color all of a sudden, it's like sometimes the color seems like it's just going to disappear. It's just yeah. going to flow away and all of a sudden this line brings you right back into, okay. I'm looking at a painting, this is where I am, this is where it ends, and yet the color extends beyond yeah. that. So, so, so yeah. And with, with this shape, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think this might be confusing, but it's a geometric shape, but I'm not thinking about geometric no. things. <laughs> You know, it has to do with uh, this brush stroke and then the way the brush, like the brush work was moving in this way when the light came through in the painting, that it just seemed, once this line went in, it wasn't, it organized the painting and it gave it stability, but it didn't, but it didn't lock it down. So it's like if you follow the brush work behind the line, you move and change and go in all different directions. Uh, it's also, I'm, I'm balancing this thing between things that are very deliberate and things that are very spontaneous. So the line was very deliberately made, yes, and then the brushwork was actually very spontaneous. So it's just this uh, mix, and often I don't put them together in the same painting, but in this case, I just felt like the right thing. Does it maybe also have something to do with nature and architecture in some way? Yeah. <coughs> I have a feeling you are really kind of connected to nature and with the colors you're working and this line thing brings somehow this kind of opposite pair to it in a way, mm -hmm. the architectural way of mm -hmm. seeing things or because we see nature very often together with architecture and somehow maybe this is also structuring nature. Yeah. Yeah, that's true because... Yeah. Yeah, one of the things about some, especially like a lyrical kind of abstraction, is it's haunted by landscape. It always gets turned into to landscape, or sometimes with other paintings, to design or graphic. And the paintings are so much about landscape. Is they, like you said, they're about nature. They're really about weather. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the show title comes from a, a poem, which is uh, "One Must Have a Mind of Winter." It's from this poem called "The Snowman," which I like as an aphorism. In a way. It's very nice to think like it's about identification. So I'm thinking about identification with nature, with weather, with mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, in the case of the painting behind you, it's about uh, the certain light that was coming through the window that I saw in this apartment uh, in you know the middle of December and January in Reykjavik that had this granular kind of light. So it's very much about a natural experience like that. And for me, the painting is to give a sensation of being in that. And I think, you know, I studied landscape architecture, and I, was, I first wanted to be an architect, so I was very interested in architecture. But I don't think of them as architecture in terms of building. You know, uh, 
I have different associations with them, but I think that's I think that's there. I think you can read it that way very well. Yeah. So uh, what, what is it about Iceland, it, uh, Iceland, and its weather that, that makes you so interested? <laughs> well, I just love it. It's just it's great. You know, I get this question a lot. You know, and I didn't go to Iceland to like look for a landscape, or you know, I was invited to go on a horseback ride, but right? and and. Uh, and I know that people want, I want to explain it like there's the light in Iceland. The truth is I just like how I feel there. I really just love it. Uh, but there's something about this rough, barren landscape with an ethereal kind of light that just knocks me out. And it's, uh, it's really beautiful. I also like cold light. I just like cold light. You know, I like Nordic light. So, um, but um, there's also something is that it's really rough. It's kind of rough and it's wild and there's kind of a freedom there for me. So that's what I like about it. You are in the vicinity of being uh, an impressionist, uh, and, and of course you cannot. That, that, uh, so in the next moment, you take it back to the surface and, and from in this uh, realm beyond the surface. The, I wouldn't even say illusion, but this uh, feeling uh, that the paint suggests space. Of course, any uh, holistic image also has the capacity of, of suggesting space. But what I find so interesting is that with little means, either markings or uh, a brush stroke, uh, you make it come back to the actual activity of painting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is always per definition in the surface. Yeah. So, um, and that's all we have with painting. Yeah. You know, I made the decision to use a uh, to use the rectangle to use to keep the brush, mm -hmm. and I want that that surface always mm -hmm. to be present. So a lot of like the marks that you see on the surface or the lines, like you said, it does. It just brings it right back mm. to the surface. And it also helps sometimes push the paint back into the surface. Mm. And I think part of it is so that, like unlike those street art paintings where you get catapulted into this you know, other realm, um, I want the realm I'm interested in is here and now. Like right just when you start to go away, you immediately come back and say, here I am. All right. Anybody else who wants to say something intelligent? <laughs> 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 if not, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you all very much.